I love Greek sculpture. I love the archaic. I love the classical and all of its restraint and harmony. But I have to tell you, I really love the Hellenistic. And the reason I do is because of two fragments from a great frieze from Pergamon. One has Athena at its center and one has Zeus. And I can see why you love these sculptures. They combine what's most wonderful about ancient Greek sculpture, the love of the body, but also the sense of expressiveness and drama, which we associate so much with the Hellenistic. The Hellenistic refers to the last period of Greek art, the last phase of Greek art, after the death of Alexander the Great. Now, Alexander, whose father had been a king in northern Greece, in Macedonia, had been able to conquer all of Greece and ultimately conquer an enormous territory well beyond Greece's original borders. And in so doing, he expanded the influence of Greek culture across a much wider area. That's right. He, in a sense, Hellenized this area or made it Greek. His expanded territory reached from the ancient civilization of Egypt all the way to the border between Persia and India to the Indus Valley itself. It was an enormous territory. But after he died, his empire was divided among his four generals. And one of those generals saw a hilltop near the coast of Turkey, which he believed was an important defensive position, and there founded the garrison of Pergamon that became ultimately the kingdom of Pergamon. And those are the people that built this fabulous altar and sculpted this fabulous frieze. So what's going on here is a battle between the giants and the gods and goddesses of Mount Olympus. We're witnessing a celestial battle of enormous proportions. This is the great mythic battle where the giants battle the Olympian gods for supremacy of the earth and the universe. So let's take a close look at it. Let's start with the fragment that has Athena at its center. She is graceful and beautiful even as she battles a ferocious giant, a titan. It's clear who's going to win. Athena looks totally in control. She's grabbed Alcyonus by the hair, pulling him out of the earth, disempowering him. His mother on the other side, completely unable to help him, although she's wild with fear over what's about to happen to her son. Look at the way the artist, whoever it is, has actually constructed this image. My eye starts with Athena herself, where her head would have been. My eye rides down that beautiful arm until it's grasped almost tenderly by Alcyonus. It continues around his elbow and then across his face and down his chest. I notice that one of Athena's snakes is biting him on his right side. My eye then sweeps down that gorgeous curve that is his body, his torso, that leads into his leg. But it's slowed down by almost the staccato of the intersections of the deeply carved drape that belongs to Athena. And of course, that all leads us right back to Alcyonus' mother. So it's as though Athena, this powerful, in-control goddess, is bracketed on either side by these passionate, wild figures who are being defeated. And at the same time, Athena is being crowned by a winged Nike who comes from behind with a crown for her head. So there's really a sense here of figures coming from behind, of figures coming from below, of something that's completely in flux, something that's completely in motion with an incredible sense of drama. It's as if the entire surface of this marble is swirling in a kind of counterclockwise motion around Athena's shield, which is at its very center. It is full of diagonals, which activates the surface. It is full of the deepest carving that creates this brilliant contrast between the highlights of the exposed bodies and the dark shadows behind them. But what's also amazing to me is the complexity of the positions of their bodies. Athena, who moves toward the left, keeps her arm to the right, and then Alcyonus lifts his head up, twists his shoulders, his legs spill back behind him, and we're really talking about virtuoso sculpting here of the human body. Imagine what this would have looked like when it was painted. You know, we think so often about Greek sculpture as being just this brilliant white marble, but you have to remember that all of this was brilliantly painted. 
Let's take a look at the fragment with Zeus at its center. Like Athena, he seems composed and totally in control. Even as he rushes forward, we have no doubt that he's the victor here. So Zeus is an enormously powerful figure. We have this beautiful exposed chest and abdomen and this wildly, almost living drapery that seems to whip around his legs. And he is taking on not one, but three giants at the same moment. But luckily he's the king of the gods. So he's got things like eagles and thunderbolts to help him out. That's right. If you look at the upper right, you can see that an eagle, Zeus's emblem, is taking on the elder titan. As the eagle is preoccupying that giant, Zeus is able to turn his attention to the giant at his feet, who is on his knees and is shortly going to be vanquished. You can see that on Zeus's other side, he has just finished putting away a giant who is, almost seems to be sitting on a rock. He's got stuck in his thigh what looks like a torch, but is actually the way that the Greeks represented Zeus's thunderbolts. Ouch, that has to hurt. <laughs> it does. There is a sense of heroism, a sense of balance, even as there is the sense of the momentary and a kind of excitement that really pulls us in. You know, the story of the gods and the giants is a story that was really important to the Greeks. It was really a set of symbols that spoke of the Greeks' fear, but also optimism that they could overcome chaos. So this battle is really a metaphor for the victory of Greek culture over the unknown, over the chaotic forces of nature. Right, and also represents their military victories over cultures that they didn't understand and that they feared. So let's walk up the stairs of the great altar into the most sacred part of the altar where the fire, presumably to Zeus, would have been lit and where sacrifices might have been offered. You had mentioned earlier that the figures seem to almost spill out away from the wall, and I think that's most clearly seen as we walk up the stairs. There are moments when the figures that are carved in this high relief actually rest their knee on the stairs, actually literally enter our space. For instance, one of the sea nymphs, whose legs actually end in the tail of a great serpent, coils her tail on one of the stairs. There is this wonderful way in which they literally pour out into our world. And so this whole drama is unfolding around us, moving into our space, I mean, it must have been an amazing thing to have seen. One of the questions that comes to mind is why are these sculptures here in Berlin? And the answer can be found in the political ambitions of Prussia at the time. They very much wanted to be the equal of the French and the British. And that meant in part to have great museums that express the civilizations of the past. So they could be, in a sense, the inheritors of the great classical tradition, which was so revered in the 19th century. You know, Berlin in some ways wanted to be the new Rome. And so one of the great things about being in the Pergamon Museum in Berlin is that instead of just putting what remains of the frieze on the wall, they've reconstructed the altar and as much of the frieze as possible. And so we really get a sense of what this was like in the city of Pergamum in the 3rd century BC. Right, and so if this was the 3rd century, we would be on the Acropolis, this hilltop in the city of Pergamon, about 20 miles from the coast in what is now Turkey. We would walk up this hill and we would find the altar of Zeus surrounded by a great library that is reported to have had 200,000 scrolls, a garrison for soldiers, a royal palace for the king. And so this whole drama is unfolding around us, moving into our space. I mean, it must have been an amazing thing to have seen in the second century BC.